Hello, everybody, and welcome into the Bible Reading Podcast, episode number 116. Today's big Bible questions are, how do we fear the Lord, and what does it look like to fear the Lord? So happy Thursday to you, friends. Today was a beautiful and warm, sunny, awesome day in Central California, and honestly, I think that has many people, including my kids, antsy. Antsy is probably not strong enough of a word, but antsy for a return to regular life. I'm rooting for that to be sooner rather than later, but I fully expect it to be later rather than sooner. Alas. On a walk today with my wife, she asked me how much longer I thought the quarantine and shutdown would last, and I obviously have no idea, but the answer I gave her kind of came out of nowhere and went something like this. I think it's going to last until the people of God begin to walk in the fear of the Lord again. Now, I didn't really intend for that kind of Bible juke to just come out like that, but there you go. I do believe there is some truth to the statement, especially after reading Leviticus 26 yesterday. I don't know about you, but that passage kind of rattled me a little bit. Today's Bible readings are from Leviticus 27, Psalm 34, Ecclesiastes 10, and Titus chapter 2. A few episodes ago, we talked about the fear of the Lord. Perhaps the main thing we saw in that episode is that the Bible discusses the fear of the Lord frequently and points to walking in the fear of the Lord as absolutely crucial to prospering, protection, and persevering in the faith. It will be a theme we return to fairly regularly, much like the resurrection, the gospel, spiritual gifts, repentance, and others like it. Today we're going to get some practical advice from the Psalms that gives us directions on how to fear the Lord, what it looks like when we do fear the Lord. So, Let's go read Psalm 34 and then come back and discuss it. Psalm chapter 34, verse 1 in the Christian Standard Bible. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will boast in the Lord. The humble will hear and be glad. Proclaim the Lord's greatness with me. Let us exalt his name forever together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and rescued me from all of my fears. Those who look to him are radiant with joy. Their faces will never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him from all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and rescues them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. How happy is the person who takes refuge in him. You who are his holy ones, fear the Lord, for those who fear him lack nothing. Young lions lack food and go hungry, but those who seek the Lord will not lack any good thing. Come, children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Who is someone who desires life, loving a long life to enjoy what is good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from deceitful speech. Turn away from evil and do what is good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their cry for help. The face of the Lord is set against those who do what is evil, to remove all memory of them from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears and rescues them from all their troubles. The Lord is near the brokenhearted. He saves those crushed in spirit. One who is righteous has many adversities, but the Lord rescues him from them all. He protects all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Evil brings death to the wicked, And those who hate the righteous will be punished. The Lord redeems the life of his servants, and all who take refuge in him will not be punished. So, first we see there the wonderful promise of God to be free from fear and what comes to those who fear the Lord. So, verse 4 says, I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and he rescued me from all my fears. Then verse 7 says, The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and rescues them. That's become one of my favorite verses here lately as we go through this coronavirus pandemic scare. Uh, it's scary. Like, I, it's really scary, especially if you read about it. And I take great comfort in the promise of uh, Psalm 34, verse 7. And then we see the how-to of God-fearing, starting in verse 11. Come, children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Who is someone who desires life, loving a long life to enjoy what is good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from deceitful speech. Turn away from evil and do what is good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their cry for help. The face of the Lord is set against those who do what is evil to remove all memory of them from the earth. So how do you walk in the fear of the Lord? Well, according to this passage, it's sort of simple. 
And I see four big steps here. Number one, keep your tongue from evil. Now, that word for evil in Hebrew is ra, and it means the opposite of good. It means hurtful, malicious, wicked, against the ways of God. It's a fairly blanket term, and it would include pretty much anything that God's word forbids, you know, swearing slash cussing, complaining, attacking, grumbling, tearing down, coarse and crude joking, hate speech, etc. So if we want to walk in the fear of the Lord and all of the blessings that come from that, number one, we want to keep our tongue from evil. Number two, we want to keep our lips from deceitful speech. Now this doesn't merely mean don't lie, but it also includes deceit and guile and deception. In other words, to walk in the fear of God, you and I should be straightforward and honest in our words and not try to mislead people or trick them or fool them or misdirect them, etc. Number three, turn away from evil. It's another very simple way of saying repent. Repenting is turning away from our own deeds, our, our evil deeds, and turning to God and to God's ways. Finally, number four, if we want to walk in the fear of the Lord, we will seek and pursue peace. Now, this double command seems to indicate an impassioned pursuit of peace, not just a half-hearted attempt at it. A person of God will not only desire to be peaceful, but they will seek it. They will pursue it. They will give themselves to walking in peace. They will run hard after it. And so what are the promises of walking in this way? Oh, there's a ton all through scripture. Long life and blessing, the protection of God, the angel of the Lord camping around you, rescue from adversaries and the refuge and protection of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, this is the way. Walk in it. So let's close with a brief word from Brother Spurgeon, who says, He who can manage his tongue can manage his whole body, for the tongue is the rudder of the ship, and if that be properly held, the vessel will be rightly steered. If you would escape the quicksand and the rocks, look well to your tongue, keep it from evil, that it speak neither blasphemy against God nor slander against your fellow man, and keep your lips from guile, that is, from deceit, from double meanings, from saying one thing and meaning another, or making other people think that you mean another, an art all too well understood in these days. God make us plain-speaking men who say what we mean and mean what we say. When, by the grace of God, we are taught to do this, we have learned a good lesson. And I'll add, we have learned to walk in the fear of the Lord, which is a tremendous blessing. So let's go to Leviticus chapter 27, verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses, speak to the Israelites and tell them, when someone makes a special vow to the Lord that involves the assessment of people, if the assessment concerns a male from 20 to 60 year old, your assessment is 50 shekels measured by the standard sanctuary shekel. If the person is a female, your assessment is 30 shekels. If the person is from 5 to 20 years old, your assessment for a male is 20 shekels and for a female, 10 shekels. If the person is from 1 month to 5 years old, your assessment for a male is 5 silver shekels and for a female, your assessment is 3 shekels of silver. If the person is 60 years or more, your assessment is 15 shekels for a male and 10 shekels for a female. But if one is too poor to pay the assessment... He is to present the person before the priest, and the priest will set a value for him. The priest will set a value for him according to what the one making the vow can afford. If the vow involves one of the animals that may be brought as an offering to the Lord, any of these he gives to the Lord will be holy. He might not replace it or make a substitution for it, either good or bad, or bad for good. But if he does substitute one animal for another, both that animal and its substitute will be holy. If the vow involves any of the unclean animals that may not be brought as an offering to the Lord, the animal must be presented before the priest. The priest will set its value, whether high or low. The priest will be, uh, the price will be set as the priest makes the assessment for you. If the one who brought it decides to redeem it, he must add a fifth to the assessed value. When a man consecrates his house as holy to the Lord, the priest will assess its value, whether high or low. The priest will stand just as the priest, the price will stand just as the priest assesses it. But if the one who consecrated his house redeems it, he must add a fifth to the assessed value and it will be his. If a man consecrates to the Lord any part of a field that he possesses, your assessment of value will be proportional to the seed needed to sow it, at the rate of 50 silver shekels for every six bushels of barley seed. 
If he consecrates his field during the year of Jubilee, the price will stand according to your assessment. But if he consecrates his field after the Jubilee, the priest will calculate the price for him in proportion to the years left until the next year of Jubilee, so that your assessment will be reduced. If the one who consecrated the field decides to redeem it, he must add a fifth to the assessed value, and the field will transfer back to him. But if he does not redeem the field, or if he has sold it to another man, it is no longer redeemable. When the field is released in the Jubilee, it will be holy to the Lord like a field permanently set apart. It becomes the priest's property. If a person consecrates to the Lord a field he has purchased that is not part of his inherited land holding, then the priest will calculate for him the amount of the assessment up to the year of Jubilee, and the person will pay the assessed value on that day as a holy offering to the Lord. In the year of Jubilee, the field will return to the one he brought it from, the original owner. All your assessed values will be measured by the standard sanctuary shekel, 20 geras to the shekel. But no one can consecrate a firstborn of the livestock, whether an animal from the herd or flock, to the Lord, because a firstborn already belongs to the Lord. It is one of the unclean livestock. It can be ransomed according to your assessment by adding a fifth of its value to it. If it is not redeemed, it can be sold according to your assessment. Nothing that a man permanently sets apart to the Lord from all he owns, whether a person, an animal, or his inherited land holding can be sold or redeemed. Everything set apart is especially holy to the Lord. No person who has been set apart for destruction is to be ransomed. He must be put to death. Every tenth of the land's produce, grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. If a man decides to redeem any part of this tenth, he must add a fifth to its value. Every tenth animal from the herd or flock, which passes under the shepherd's rod, will be holy to the Lord. He is not to inspect whether it is good or bad, and he is not to make a substitution for it. But if he does make a substitution, both the animal and its substitute will be holy. They cannot be redeemed. These are the commands the Lord gave Moses for the Israelites on Mount Sinai. Ecclesiastes chapter 10 verse 1. Dead flies make a perfumer's oil ferment and stink, so a little folly outweighs wisdom and honor. A wise person's heart goes to the right, but a fool's heart to the left. Even when the fool walks down the road, his heart lacks sense, and he shows everyone he's a fool. If the ruler's anger rises against you, don't leave your post, for calmness puts great offenses to rest. There is an evil I have seen under the sun, an error proceeding from the presence of the ruler. The fool is appointed to great heights, but the rich remain in lowly positions. I have seen slaves on horses, but princes walking on the ground like slaves. The one who digs a pit may fall into it, and the one who breaks through a wall may be bitten by a snake. The one who quarries stones may be hurt by them. The one who splits logs may be endangered by them. If the axe is dull and one does not sharpen its edge, then one must exert more strength. However, the advantage of wisdom is that it brings success. If the snake bites before its charm, then there is no advantage for the charmer. The words from the mouth of a wise person are gracious, but the lips of a fool consume him. The beginning of the words from his mouth is folly, but the end of his speaking is evil madness. Yet the fool multiplies words. No one knows what will happen, and who can tell anyone what will happen after him? The struggles of fools weary them, for they don't know how to go to the city. Woe to you, land, when your king is a youth, and your princes feast in the morning. Blessed are you, land, when your king is a son of nobles, and your princes feast at the proper time, for strength and not for drunkenness. Because of laziness the roof caves in, and because of negligent hands the house leaks. A feast is prepared for laughter, and wine makes life happy, and money is the answer for everything. Do not curse the king even in your thoughts, and do not curse a rich person even in your bedroom, for a bird of the sky may carry the message, and a winged creature may report the matter. Titus chapter 2 verse 1, You are to proclaim things consistent with sound teaching. Older men are to be self-controlled, worthy of respect, sensible, and sound in faith, love, and endurance. In the same way, older women are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not slaves to excess drinking, They are to teach what is good so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands and to love their children, to be self-controlled, pure, workers at home, kind and in submission to their husband so that God's word will not be slandered. In the same way, encourage the young men to be self-controlled in everything. Make yourself an example of good works with integrity and dignity in your teaching. Your message is to be sound beyond reproach so that any opponent will be ashamed 
because he doesn't have anything bad to say about us. Slaves are to submit to their masters in everything and to be well-pleasing, not taking back or stealing, but demonstrating utter faithfulness so that they may adorn the teaching of our God, of God our Savior in everything. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, instructing us to deny godlessness and worldly lusts and to live a life in a sensible, righteous, and godly way in the present age, while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to cleanse for himself a people for his own possession, eager to do good works. Proclaim these things, encourage and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Well, friends, I pray that today's word and devotion was an edifying blessing to you. May the Lord implant his word in our hearts and may we walk in his ways and please him with our words and our actions. Good day to you and Godspeed.